Would you all join me in a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you that uh, we can gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We can worship your name. We can study your word. And I ask that while, we're, while we gather together at this time that, uh, that we would be encouraged, that we would be convicted, comforted, that we would look to you and your example and say, Lord, what, what, how do we respond? How do we live out our lives reflecting you to a broken world? Let your words be spoken this morning and let your spirit be at work amongst us. And it's your son's name we pray, amen. All right, well, good morning. Um, I gotta tell you just right off the bat that I'm like very overwhelmed and I'm very honored to be here with you this morning. Um, I've got this, uh, I'm just overwhelmed at the, the, just, the, the fact that I, like, I, I went here, I was a member here, I worshiped here, I grew at this church, uh, I moved away, uh, and then you know, I got on a plane and I flew like 1,200 miles and we're, we're worshiping together and I'm just overwhelmed and, and reminded at how, like yes, the local church exists, it's a congregation, it's a body of believers and you guys are called to minister here, but we're still connected through Christ over state lines, over countries and around the world that I just have this sense of just the community of believers this morning that I, I must confess I don't normally have. So I'm just I'm overwhelmed and I'm just humbled and honored to be here with you this morning to open up the word. Um, you know, Gary asked me uh, probably around May or June of this year if I would be open to preaching. He's, you know, he sent me their, uh, their schedule for like preaching and sermons. And I gotta tell you guys, you have a great staff. They like plan things out and they're intentional. You know, and most churches are just going week by week. So you guys have like a great team here. Just have to throw that out there. You guys have awesome people. Um, and I was just overwhelmed at the planning and the diligence, and I saw the slot there, Thanksgiving themed message. And this is like May or June, like I said, and I'm, um, I, I've, I've had different ideas and different directions that I've wanted to go in since May and June. And one of the first things I had was, okay, just like come in and, and, and find something in the scriptures that maybe people have neither either heard before or something they need to be reminded of related to thankfulness. Like what's something people need to be reminded of being thankful for? And then I stopped and I was like, well, yeah, that doesn't really seem like enough. And so then, then my, my brain started thinking about, okay, so like go to the word and find like a narrative, some, some portion of scripture where someone in the word is living out thankfulness or, or there's this, uh, just a beautiful description of what thanksgiving is or something like that. And that sounded cool, but it just wasn't enough. And uh, it, didn't, it didn't click to me until I was watching one of the, one of the series on Romans uh, when I saw like the pillars that have been up on stage. Uh, I'm a spatial thinker, um, and so I just had this, I, this image of, in my head, and you call them pillars or columns or whatever, but today what I wanna do is I, I wanna build us an entryway, okay? I wanna take a couple ideas, I wanna lay them parallel to each other. Uh, I, I want us to look at the scriptures and see what I would say is the greatest thing that a believer in Jesus Christ has to be thankful for. Okay, and I wanna, I wanna drive it right here and right next to it, parallel to it. I, I wanna go to the word and I wanna see yet another example and I want, I want us to get this image of like biblical thankfulness in action. And, and I want to drop on top of that a definition of biblical thankfulness. And, and then as we leave, I want us to walk out and I want us to say, what, well, what's it look like to walk through that entryway and, and, and then walk into a life of thanksgiving? What's that mean, I, you know, day in and day out for me to live a life of thankfulness to God. Now, I've been told before when I've preached that I bite off a little more than I can chew. That's true for today. Sorry that you have to uh, endure that with me. But we're gonna get to building, uh, and we're gonna build this point. And we're gonna start with the greatest thing that I think we have to be thankful for. And I, it, I, I wanted to stay connected to where you guys have been this fall. You guys have been in the series on Romans, Life of Faith, Power of Grace. And as I've watched through these messages, I've been convicted, I've been challenged, I've been encouraged, and I wanted this week to not just like stand alone and be outside of that. So when I knew that Frank, that the last sermon before I came was gonna be in Romans 8, um, I, I just stopped and I read through Romans 8 like a dozen times. Uh, in fact, my, my wife and I, Carly, and our son Jonah, we were out here visiting family in like July, and on the plane back, I just sat mainly like Jonah was screaming, it was terrible, and so to calm myself, I read the word, right? 
which is what you're supposed to do or whatever. So I was reading the Bible and I went through and I, I, I still have it right here. The ni- I think there's 19 things alone just in Romans 8, just generally as, as believers to be thankful for. But I'm not gonna be the guy who like puts all of those things on one slide because that's kind of obnoxious and just ridiculous. So here's a few. A few things in Romans 8 that I think we have to be thankful for. Um, the first one is right, right off the bat in verse one, that for believers, there is no condemnation. That, that what Christ achieved in his death, burial, and resurrection, and that means that for those of us who believe in him, who count him as savior, we are not condemned. It doesn't mean we're perfect, it doesn't mean that we're not gonna stumble and fall, and that we're gonna uh, always have just an upward trajectory in our growth, and our spiritual life, but what it means is we're not condemned before God. That's an amazing thing to be thankful for. Another thing in chapter eight that I see uh, that we need to just stop and reflect and acknowledge and be thankful for is that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And not just that he dwells within us, but that he gives us new life. And that might be the purpose of him indwelling us, maybe, just maybe, maybe a, a couple different things. But that we can stop as believers and we can reflect on the fact that we are indwelt by God and that God continues to come near by living within us and that he changes us by doing that. Another thing that I would say uh, Romans 8 has that we're thankful for is that we are God's children. We have the benefit of calling God our father and it, it's not like hyperbolic or it's metaphor, like it's real, he is our father. And it's an amazing thing to be thankful for. As I was reading through the chapter, this might have been my favorite until we got to the end, but the fourth, that Christ died for us. But more than that, he was raised. See, there's a, there's, there's a lot of times where when we're talking about the gospel, we focus so much on the cross and we forget this, more, well, not forget, but we just maybe downplay this reality that Jesus rose, that it didn't stop at death, it ended in life. And that is one of the greatest things we can be thankful for. These are all things that we can be thankful for as Christians, but as I read through this chapter so many times on this plane, uh, I, I saw things getting more and more serious, and I found myself getting more and more convicted of, of these objects of thankfulness in chapter eight. And then I think we come to the single greatest thing that we as believers can be thankful for, and that's, that's rooted in what Johnny read for us during the worship. But the single greatest thing we as believers in Jesus Christ have to be thankful for is that nothing can separate you or I from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Paul describes powers and principalities and all of these things within the world, but the, add it onto the list that like you can't separate yourself from God. The, 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 way that you view your, your, the way that you view yourself, the way that you m- might be convicted or weighed down by your, the sins of your past or the struggles of your present, like not even that can separate you from God once you've believed. Nothing can separate you from God. There are so many things in this life that we can be thankful for as believers. We can be thankful for the people that God's put in our lives, the place that he's put us in. We can be thankful for, for the, the, like the tangible material blessings that he's given us and that he provides us with each day. We can be thankful for ideas that are in us and around the world. But the single greatest thing that a believer in Jesus Christ has to be thankful for is a new position. That through, through what Jesus does on the cross and his resurrection, that the one who would believe and have faith and have trust in him gets transported from one space and into another one. You get taken, you get taken from, from a place of separation and, and, and farther, farther from God and are brought near to the God of the universe. We have a changed position. This is our first column of our entryway that I wanna build for us this morning. The greatest object of our thankfulness is a changed position through the love of Jesus Christ with our God. And nothing can take that away from you. But parallel right next to it, right, because we're building an entryway and that's not just one thing, that's multiple things. I wanna look at the greatest, uh, what I would argue, is possibly the greatest example of thankfulness in the scriptures. And in order to do that, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to get some context, okay? Um, this, is, this is where it might get a little dull for a minute or two, so just like bear with me. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna look at Psalm 118 in a moment, but we're gonna do it in light of a couple different things. And so what we have to understand is like the history of the nation of Israel, 
very briefly, okay? So God calls the people out of Egypt. He takes them into this land of Canaan. He gives them the land. It takes them a long time. Uh, they have highs and lows. They have prophets and priests and good kings and bad. And, and things get so south after so many hundreds of years that God says, look, okay, in order for me to chasten you and to discipline you and to make you into the nation that I've called you to be, I'm going to allow this foreign power called Babylon to come in and just extract you out of the land. See, because God put them in the land to be a light to the nations. And in fact, ultimately over time, they just became like the nations. And so God uses the king and the empire of Babylon to take the people out and bring them into captivity. And when we read like extra biblical texts, we, we, we read about what the rabbis were doing during this time of Babylonian captivity. Well, one of the things that we come to learn is that Psalms 113 through 118 become like this, this hymn book of worship for the people of Israel. And so that while they're in captivity and they're, they're still trying to, to find out what, is it, what does it mean to be an Israelite out of the land, they, they use Psalms 113 through 118 as like their canon of worship for their high holy days. So, so for like the Day of Atonement and their offerings of thanksgiving and their, their like feast of booths and their feast of weeks and everything that you can read in the Old Testament that they use to celebrate celebrate the nation and to celebrate God. These, these six psalms are used as worship at all of these events. And this includes the Passover. So we know that this is part of, of Israel's worship as a, as a people. And then it gets developed during captivity. And, and, and I, I want us to also think about Mark, okay? Uh, the Gospel of Mark in chapter 14 records uh, the, the Last Supper and Jesus celebrating the Passover feast with his disciples. Uh, they're, they're in the upper room. They're, they're celebrating the Passover. They're breaking bread. They're drinking wine. Jesus institutes uh, the Lord's Supper. He talks about his body being broken and his blood is the new covenant. And it's just a beautiful, amazing moment. I mean, he, he, he gets to his knees and, and the God of the universe like washes their feet in servanthood. All of these things are happening, and it's really easy to miss this, but as you're reading through Mark 14, there's this little verse that says, and they went away singing a hymn. Okay, so I, spoiler alert, like I wasn't there, okay? So like I cannot say definitively, like, oh yeah, I walked with Jesus, and we sang Psalm 118. But if it's true, and I think that it is, that we can know through history that, that, the, that the nation of Israel was using these psalms to worship on these high holy days, and if Mark's little random, like why put that in there? Why include that they went away singing a hymn? What I want us to do this morning is I'm gonna argue that they go, they leave the upper room and they walk through the city of Jerusalem singing Psalm 118. And if you get nothing else from today, and I'm dead serious, just get the image. Because we're gonna read the whole Psalm here in a second when I stop talking. And I just want you to picture Jesus singing this hymn with the disciples who just don't have a clue, knowing that he's walking through the city. He's, he, he's gonna look and he's gonna see the temple. He's gonna walk out of this eastern gate and he's gonna go up to the Mount of Olives to be betrayed. And he's doing it with this psalm on his lips. Follow along if you like, or just listen and get this image in your brain. Starting in verse one. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I called on the Lord, and the Lord answered me, and he set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off as they surrounded me. Surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. 
The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. That the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is good and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Do you have that image of the Savior singing this? He's singing victory over his imminent impending death. Knowing exactly what's gonna follow, knowing that he's walking to be betrayed and and to to face unfair trials and and, uh, physical abuse and mockery and crucifixion. He can sing victory over death. Not only that, he, he gave himself as an offering of thanksgiving for you and for me. If that doesn't uh, warm your heart or convict you, I, mean, I don't know that I know what will, but he, there's this sense in which if we're gonna like model Christ in the world that we live in, we have to realize that it's gonna take everything we have and everything we are because that's what we're called to do. And so part of the learning from this example of amazing thankfulness in action is realizing that you, we can step out with confidence into spaces that we don't know, we don't understand, and we can't control, and we can still be thankful for it. We can still be thankful for how God's gonna use us, no matter what we're stepping into, and we're called to give ourselves away. I would argue that Christ's death, burial, and resurrection was the single greatest act of kingdom advancement in human history. And it was done as an act of thankfulness and it was an offering of thanksgiving. Now with these two things running parallel to each other, right? That you can be thankful for a new position and the example of thankfulness despite horrific circumstances. Thankfulness for God and his work within you. Thankfulness for him being your salvation. These two things together, I, wanna, I just wanna drop on top of this entry point a definition that I think we can get of what biblical thankfulness is. And simply put, I, I believe that biblical thankfulness is our response to God's faithfulness. Because we, we read through Psalm 118, and the psalmist who wrote the psalm describes God becoming his salvation. Jesus is singing the words and saying the same exact thing as the psalmist, that the the Lord has become my salvation. The, The psalmist who writes this, Jesus who sings it in us today, we can say that when God demonstrates his faithfulness to us, that we experience his salvation. I'm not talking about like when you place your faith and trust in Jesus and you become a Christian. I'm talking about the day in and day out process of becoming more like Jesus. And so that when, when, when hard times come, uh, we, can, we can look to his faithfulness and see that he's delivered us. And we can do it over and over and over again. And it drives our heart toward thankfulness and thanksgiving. So biblical thankfulness is our response to God's faithfulness. But here's the thing. Uh, we're, we're, we're gonna gather together as families and as friends this week and we're gonna, many of you will probably sit around a table and have a wonderful meal. And you're gonna talk about what you're thankful for. And I think that that's great. I think that getting together and sharing, I'm thankful for my family or I'm thankful for my job, I'm thankful for the changes that I've experienced since last Thanksgiving, I think all of those things are amazing. But when we think about biblical thankfulness, it can never stop at mere acknowledgement. It always turns into action. So our response to God's faithfulness cannot stop 
at just saying, Lord, thank you for what you've given me. Lord, thank you for the position that you've brought me into through your son. It, ha- it, it can start there, but it can't finish there. It always has to move into the space that says, Lord, uh, my perspective changes because of my new position. So what I want to encourage us this morning is to realize that when you have a changed position because of Christ's work on your behalf, that, that your perspective and how you view the people, the places, the things that God has blessed you with has to change. And it has to drive us to realize that we're called to offer our own lives as a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Our our, our acting and living lives of thankfulness needs to be similar to the example of our Savior who offered himself freely for us. And we need to do the same. We've been called to this, this Christian life as believers to give our lives away. We've been, Jesus tells us that if, we, that if we want to find our lives, we have to lose it. And in order to, in this process, what happens is that we end up being exactly what we were created by God to be. We've been called to put the kingdom of God above all else because that's the only hope that this world and that humanity has for being redeemed. God became flesh and came near to us. And he's still near us through the power of the Spirit. And the greatest way that we can live a life of thankfulness now, here, today, tomorrow, is to give everything you have and everything you are to the greatest work of redemption. To go out and make the gospel of Jesus Christ visible through your actions. not just your words. Because this is how the kingdom of God gets advanced. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't advance by people just saying like, hey God, thank you for this, thank you for that. The kingdom of God advances today by the power of the spirit when people who, who are thankful to God go out and then give themselves back, give themselves away to a broken world. And I have to tell you that while like, I, this is extremely difficult in a lot of different ways. We live in an amazing time where this is actually kind of easy because something you have to realize is that we, we as Christians in this country don't, like we are completely unique to, human, to Christian history. We have never faced persecution, ever. We live in a privileged place and we've been put in a space that we actually have the freedom to go out and do this in the public square. We're not persecuted by the state. We don't have laws put on top of us that crush us down. And, I, and I, love, I love all of you too much to like pretend that getting picked on for your faith is the same thing as persecution, because it's not. We live in a world where we can go out and we can actively give our lives away at, to the world that's in need of redemption. And we're not burdened by anything. There are no obstacles to that except what we bring to the table. But in order to do this and do it well, we have to be able to look at the world around us and see just how broken and bruised that it is. Now, I'm only, I'm only here for today. Like, I get on a plane at Hartford, so, uh, at like five o'clock. And I don't really wanna talk about politics with you, but I could, since I you know, don't work here. <laughs> and that's not my goal. My goal is to talk about the current state of affairs because how can you bring, how can you give yourself away as an, as an act of thanksgiving if you don't know the world that you're giving yourself to? And I know that I'm young. I'm only 27. My memory's not great. But I, I don't know that I've ever seen our country where it currently is. I, we, we, live in a, we live in a world that is divided more than I've ever seen it around totally just sad things. We live in a world where hate crimes are on the rise? Like, what is that? I don't care who you voted for. I don't care like what your partisan positions are on anything. What I care about is why you support what you support. What I care about is the body of Christ taking advancing the kingdom of God more seriously and being more invested in that than the state. Because guys, the sad truth of the matter is that this country is not the greatest hope for good in the world. The gospel of Jesus Christ is. 
So I don't care who you vote for. I don't care who you support. I care why you go out and you involve yourself in the public square. And I care deeply that you stop and ask yourself, uh, in a world that's divided by hate and by race and and by sexism and by fear and anger, that you would stop and say, Lord, you've put me in a place. You've changed my position. So now that I'm in you, how can I give my life away to heal the wounds in my world? And I don't know what those, those wounds are specifically. I haven't lived here for five years, so I don't know what you guys are dealing with here day in and day out. I know that in Texas, I live in a, I live in a part of the state that sees an average of 500 people move to the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex every day. And 70% of them are not Americans. I live in an amazing place to spread the gospel throughout the world. I don't know what the stats are here. I don't know what, I don't know what the culture's like here. I don't know what your struggles are. I don't know, I, don't, I, I haven't lived here for too much time to be able to speak specifics to your life. But I know that our country's broken and I don't care about how and I don't care about the specifics and what people you think can or can't do in Washington. What I care about is that the church take its role and responsibility seriously and realize that when we put discipleship before partisanship, we can change the world. Because that's when God uses us. You cannot give your life away as an act of thanksgiving unless you're honest about where you are. That's the only reason I brought any of that up. And it's to remind us and encourage us that Christianity is not about abandoning the world. See, it'd be pretty easy for me to get up here and say, like, the world's broken and, like, really messed up. So what we need to do is just, like, back away from it and just save ourselves. Okay, that's nonsense. And it's not Christianity. There's this temptation, and I've had it myself, where you look at the sinful world and you say, oh my gosh, man, it's so broken. And that sin looks so messy. And I can't get near it because it might affect my holiness. That's not Christ-like either. If we look around at the world and all we see is something that needs to be abandoned, you will not be used by God to redeem it. If we look around and we see humanity as something that needs to be escaped because it's sinful, if we look at ourselves and our bodies and we say that they're sinful bodies that we need to detach from and get out of and escape, We're missing the point and we won't be used to redeem those things. Jesus came near to change the world. The spirit indwells you to change the world. We have to learn from that and we can't leave the place that we've been put in. Christianity is about how God the Father used his son to redeem everything and how the Spirit ministers in the world now to continue to advance his kingdom and his presence in the world. You will not be used to advance the kingdom if your goal is to escape this place, and you will not be used in God's work of redemption of your fellow man if you've decided to abandon them. The psalmist um, in Psalm 118 describes the gates of, the righteous, gates of righteousness. He says, open to me the gates of, of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. We've, we've, we've said that the greatest thing we can be thankful for is a position. And it's a position that we have with nearness to God through the love of Jesus Christ. We've said that the greatest example of thankfulness is this, this idea of Jesus singing victory over death and, and giving himself as a thanksgiving sacrifice. And we, we've defined biblical thankfulness as our response, our action in response to God's faithfulness. And that the action, the space that we walk into is to give everything we have and everything we are as an act of, of thanksgiving and as a sacrifice. So what I wanna do today, what I wanna encourage you is to ask yourself, will you go out this week and let your changed position with God and the example of his son's thankfulness put into action, will you let that change the way you live? Will you let your new perspective, your new position change your perspective? Will you start to ask yourself, God, like how can you use me in this place? Like I don't love the cube that I sit in every day at work. I'm not, I'm, the, the tasks that I do are not what I feel called to do 
but that doesn't matter because he's put me there. So if I let my changed position shape my perspective, I stop asking the questions, why am I here? And I start saying, God, how can you use me while I am here? You're gonna ask those questions about your marriage and about your children, about your brothers and sisters, about your friends and your family who are, who are still not saved and don't know Jesus the Savior. Will you offer yourself everything, you, everything that God has given you Everything that you might talk about this week at the table when you, when you have your turkey and your stuffing and your taters and everything else, are you gonna stop and you're just like, I'm thankful for fill in the blank. And then is the next thought in your head gonna be like, how can that be used to advance the kingdom? Because brothers and sisters, when this, when this broken world that's weighted by sin when it sees the church and, and believers in Jesus Christ give our, give our lives away as a, as a sacrifice for them, they see Jesus. And I hope this week you would ask, like, Lord, how would you have me to do this where you've put me? Would you pray with me, please? <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your faithfulness to us. I thankful that, I, I'm thankful to you that whether you've put us in a, in a time of struggle, in a, in, a, in a desert place, or you've put us in a, in a space that's a, just abounding with water and life, uh, that, that, you're, that you're near us and that we're near to you. And I ask, Lord, that we would be, that we would be encouraged by the example of your Son who could sing on his way to betrayal, he could, he could stop and he could sing, thank you. Because he knew what he, would, what he was doing and what, how it would change the world. And I ask that we would, you would, through your spirit, give us a new perspective. And that we would be able to thank you for the good times and the bad, for the blessings and the things that seem like, like trials. And that we would be able to thank you and then say, Lord, how can you use this to, to, to advance your cause? How can you use this to make your gospel visible in the world that's so desperately in need of you? Give us the courage to step into spaces that are broken and mired by sin and, and be a healing balm. I thank you so much for your word, for your son, and for your spirit. Let us all pursue them equally and let us be changed by them. It's in the name of your Son and by the power of your Spirit that I ask these things. Amen.